Many wish to argue consciousness is dependent on the brain, and without the brain, there would be no consciousness. So all we are is nothing but a few pounds of gelatinous pudding inside our skull, and everything we are is dependent on that. So without the brain, there could be no sense of the self or consciousness. When we die and the brain stops working, everything about ourselves ends. There is no afterlife, no hope. Death has the last laugh. But if this theory is true, then anyone who doesn't have a brain should also lack consciousness. And when the brain stops working, all conscious experience should end. However, we actually have several scientific cases that argue there is evidence consciousness and complex behavior can't exist without a fully formed brain or a working brain. First, British neurologist John Lorber was the first to ask if consciousness could exist without a properly working brain. Through his research, he looked at over 600 different cases of hydrocephalus, which is a condition where there is an excessive amount of cerebrospinal fluid in the skull, which hinders normal brain development. Of the most severe cases, half were severely mentally challenged. However, the other half had IQs above 100 and functioned properly, even though a normal brain was missing. One case Lorber cites is a male who had virtually no brain and only a thin layer of brain cells a millimeter thick, yet had an IQ of 126 and an honors degree in mathematics. But how could this be? If the brain is necessary for consciousness, how could subjects with abnormal brain development or almost no brain at all have a normal conscious experience, development of the self, and live as if nothing was wrong? Do not all these things depend on a complex normal brain? As Roger Lewin asked, this case is nothing new to the medical world. Scores of similar accounts litter the medical literature, and they go back a long way, observed Patrick Wall, professor of anatomy at University College London. But the important thing about Lorber is that he's doing a long series of systematic scanning, rather than just dealing with antidotes. He has gathered a remarkable set of data, and he challenges, how do we explain it? Another recent study came out and argued the same issues, but looked at subjects with hydranencephaly, which is where the brain's cerebral hemispheres are absent to some degree, and the remaining space is filled with fluid. More importantly, most of the cerebral cortex is missing. Victims of hydranencephaly are assumed to exemplify vegetable state behaviors, but their research challenges this. They found that their subjects could display an enormous amount of normal conscious behavior, such as distress to contentment, pleasure, and even joy, as expressed through screaming, crying, fussing, smiling, giggling, and laughter. Needless to say, this composite portrait of some of the behaviors and competences of children with hydranencephaly cannot be reconciled with the diagnosis, developmental vegetative state, that is commonly applied to them. These children are not only physiologically awake, in the sense of going through a sleep-wake cycle, but they are alert and responsive to environmental events during wakefulness. They turn to salient stimuli, show situationally contingent emotional reactions, and distinguish familiar voices from those of strangers all of which is incompatible with the unconsciousness of the vegetative state. Going deeper, we even have a case of someone who was born without a brain, yet displayed signs of consciousness. Most infants born without a brain are unfortunately terminated before birth. However, there is a case of one who did survive. In 1984, Andrew Vandal was born without having a brain and only a skull filled with fluid. However, against doctor's predictions, he lived and was able to laugh, smile, and was said by his adoptive mother as maturing mentally. Due to the lack of a full functioning brain, he was unable to speak, walk, or see. However, he displayed clear signs of life and consciousness. This research alone undermines established beliefs about the relationship between the human brain and where consciousness comes from. If we're going to account for all the data, how can we claim the inner workings of the complex brain create consciousness? Complex conscious behavior appears to exist without a normal complex brain. So is there any evidence that self and consciousness can exist without a brain at all? While well, many people claim to have had near-death experiences, where at some point the brain stopped working and they were pronounced dead, and yet they still had some form of awareness before being revived. Although these stories are interesting, are there any scientific studies on these claims? In fact, we have several studies that investigate the phenomenon of near-death experiences. As one 2002 study put it, recent studies in cardiac arrest survivors have indicated that although the majority of cardiac arrest survivors have no memory or recall from the event, Nevertheless, approximately 10% develop memories that are consistent with typical near-death experiences. These include an ability to see and recall specific detailed descriptions of the resuscitation as verified by resuscitation staff. Many studies in humans and animals have indicated that the brain function ceases during cardiac arrest, 
thus raises the question of how such lucid, well-structured thought processes with reasoning and memory formation can occur at such a time. A 2001 study reported a case where a man whose heart had stopped and was later revived was able to vividly report events that took place while his brain was not functioning, such as where his dentures were placed and by whom. And this experience is not an isolated incident, as other studies report similar and differing experiences while the brain is not functioning. Although not all cardiac arrest victims report experiences while the brain is not functioning, the study says, in our study about 50% of patients with a near-death experience reported awareness of being dead or had positive emotions, 30% reported moving through a tunnel, had an observation of a celestial landscape, or had a meeting with deceased relatives. About 25% of patients with a near-death experience had an out-of-body experience, had communication with the light, or observed colors. 13% experienced a life review, and 8% experienced a border. Now this study is not alone, as other studies have reported similar findings. But this specific study goes on to say, Another theory holds that near-death experiences might be a changing state of consciousness, transcendence, or the theory of continuity, in which memories, identity, and cognition with emotion function independently from the unconscious body and retain the possibility of non-sensory perception. Based on the aforementioned theoretical aspects of the obvious experience continuity of our consciousness, we finally should consider the possibility that death, like birth, may well be a mere passing from one state of consciousness to another. Now some may object that near-death experiences are hallucinations caused by deeper, undetectable levels in the brain, and some of them may be explained by this theory. But just because some of them may be, that doesn't mean all of them will be, for the simple reason that it is inconsistent with the presented data, as a portion of these experiences are actual verified events, not just visions. And the vision control system in the brain is very close to the surface and could easily be detected if there was activity in that region. In 2014, a study that took place over four years and had the largest sample size of near-death experiences reported more cases where someone was pronounced dead and later revived and could recount the details of events that happened while their brain was inactive. As the study put it, as hallucinations refer to experiences that do not correspond with objective reality, our findings do not suggest that vertical awareness, near-death experiences, and cardiac arrest is likely to be hallucinatory or illusory since the recollections correspond with actual verified events. Thus, if consciousness is dependent on brain functioning, how could consciousness exist while the brain is inactive? It is much harder to dismiss these experiences if they are able to report verified details while their brains are inactive. Therefore, the physicalist philosophy that consciousness is produced by the inner workings of a complex brain cannot explain this data that consciousness can exist without the need of a brain. But this data is fully consistent with what we have argued for in earlier videos, which is the dual aspect idealist view of ourselves. Instead of the brain producing the sense of the self and consciousness, consciousness is fundamental and the brain is an emergent creation of the self or mind, which is meant to increase intelligence and build an identity for the self. Without a complex brain, one could possibly be limited in forming thoughts, memories, a personality, and having a normal experience of physical reality. And as we've already discussed, this is what the studies on brain damage victims show us. What is affected and changed by brain damage are these things, but consciousness in the self is still shown to be unified and retained. But now a question arises. If the brain is used by the mind for forming thoughts, a personality, memories, and an experience in the physical world, how could someone retain and form memories after death, if the brain, which is used to create these things, stops working? In fact, how exactly could the workings of near-death experiences be explained? Well, building on what we talked about in the last video in this series, we have concluded from the evidence the brain is a quantum information processor, and therefore that would mean the information inside the brain would be held together through quantum entanglement. But when there would be a disruption to the normal workings of the brain and death is caused, the brain's computation would stop. But information is never lost or destroyed, it is only transformed. So the quantum information in our brain, our thoughts, our dreams, personality, memories, etc., would simply disconnect from the brain but still be held together by entanglement and simply carry on without the body. This would explain how it's possible for someone to retain their identity and carry on after they are pronounced dead. But if they are revived, the brain begins to work again and the information re-entangles with the brain from whence it came and returns to life so to speak. Thus the quantum information that is built up in this life could possibly continue on as this theory predicts and would account for and explain how near-death experiences are possible. Therefore, this life would just be the start, and death would be far from the end, but just another beginning, 
Our time in this life would be important for allowing us to have experiences to make choices and build an identity. But if this theory holds true, and the evidence of near-death experiences and quantum mind theory indicated it's probable, our journey would be far from over upon death. Perhaps our identity and consciousness will leave this place and go on to entangle with something or someone far greater than we could ever imagine.